mathematics. Um, I'm not sure whether there was a quiz being given or something for all the PhD students so that they already know Ratner's theorem when they come to the conference. I, I don't know, but let's just review it quickly. <laughs> so the one that sort of is more important for what I'm going to talk about is Dunn's measure conjecture, so this Ratner's theorem. And it's saying let G be a Lie group, let gamma be a discrete subgroup so that we can define the quotient G mod gamma or G mod gamma, whatever direction you want to quotient by. Let U be a unipotent one parameter subgroup. Um, someone might complain what nilpotent means. I realized later I should have written add nilpotent. So you let it act. On the so everything here is sort of defined. If it's not yet a matrix group, it's defined using the adjoint representation. So you let your one parameter subgroup act on the Lie algebra by adjoint representation. And you want this to be unipotent, meaning you want all your eigenvalues to be one when this acts. Um, that's sort of a very algebraic condition, right? It's just finite dimensional vector space, some action, some eigenvalue should be one. And it's a bit surprising that this is sufficient to actually completely describe and, and tell you lots and lots and lots of things about the action of you on this manifold. So you take G mod gamma and you ask what are the U invariant and the Gothic probability measures on this quotient and they're all algebraic. That's the answer. That was the conjecture of Dani. And it's an amazing theorem. And what I also find, it's sort of proving special cases. If you think about a particular group doing that, that's great. You can do this in a class. You can explain it well. And it's wonderful. But I have a great respect for Marina that she, after doing SL2 cross SL2, she immediately did the general case. So somehow, Elon and I, we have been doing a related program. And it feels a bit more like we're doing a case. And then we had another case. And we're sort of going down the classification case by case. And yeah. So she didn't do it like that. SL2 cross SL2. And then she let she be arbitrary. That was really an amazing thing. And of course, the Dani measure classification conjecture was <laughs> motivated by a conjecture of Raghunathan's. Same setting, you take an X, you look at the orbit closure. And the orbit closure is always a nice algebraic set. It's always X times L. So there are no fractal dimensions popping up or something. It's always a nice manifold. It's a beautiful conjecture and a beautiful result. And of course, she proved more. She actually proved that the orbit equidistributes with respect to the measure that's appearing here. But gamma is the let is in this theorem. Yeah, true. Thank you. So that's the second correction. Um, assuming gamma in G is a lattice. And of course, yeah. If gamma is just a trivial group, there will not be happening much. So you want non-divergence of orbits, for instance. So hence, um, Magulis's earlier results about non-divergence of unipotent trajectories is very much the beginning of the whole story and is important for everything that happened afterwards. Now everything is good. What? Ah, <laughs> want another board? No, sorry. Um, Another theorem that I think fits very well with what I want to say later in this sort of in this realm, just a little bit after, is an amazing theorem of Schacher and Nimisch. Where is he hiding? So I need this. Ha! Then I can look in this direction of Schacher and Nimisch theorem. Moses Schacher. Let mu n be a sequence of in, uh, unipotent invariant and a Gothic probability measures by which I mean for each one of them there's a one parameter subgroup like so so that the measure is the 
of course, by the sphere itself, an algebraic measure sitting on a closed orbit. This else could be different. The u's even could be different along the sequence. Uh, assume that mu n converges to mu in the weak star topology. This is kind of an ob without loss of generality because, of course, the space of probability measures should be weak star compact. It should be. It's not quite, of course, because if I didn't say that my x is compact. If my x is compact, then the space of probability measures would be compact. If my x is not compact, then I need to take the space of measures of that are probability or less. That would be a compact space, and I'm not saying that the mu is a probability measure. Then one of two things happens. Then mu is equal to zero. That's a possibility. You have complete escape of mass. And actually, for obvious reasons, that's part of the theorem. And support of mu n just escapes to infinity. You have this support. It's, it's a subset of your x. And x is not compact. But the support actually wanders off to infinity. And if this happens, there's no chance for the measure to stay. And they're saying, if it's not a probability measure, this is what's happening. The measure is walking off to infinity, including the support. Or, well, mu is like that. It's again an L invariant and uh, Haar measure on x for some on a closed L orbit. And a unipotent subgroup acts agonically. Maybe L is, is much bigger, but there is a subgroup, a unipotent subgroup that would still act agonically. If you want to have one parameter subgroup, it doesn't matter. So in particular, it's sort of saying that the, say if you ex can exclude this case, maybe, maybe your space is compact. Then it's in particular saying that the space of measures that are ergodic for a one parameter subgroup, unipotent one parameter subgroup, that space of measures is closed itself. For a diagonal flow, this would be very different and completely wrong. But for the unipotent flow, this is a very satisfying statement. Yeah, I didn't say it, it will definitely not write down. In the second case, you also have a very strong statement about the support. So the measures mu n, they have support for large n. They are basically inside this L orbit. They might not be inside this L board, so you have to kick them a little bit. And after you kick them, they are inside the L orbit. And then the equidistribution sort of happens from within. So it's a very algebraic, very uniform, nice <coughs> statement. So you need gamma to be on this one? <coughs> yes. Yes. I want gamma to be, uh, do I need to do that? I <laughs> need to ask them, but I would, yeah, because of the non-divergence, you want non-divergence yeah. statements somehow? Yeah. yeah. I, I would, f yes. Huh? Dichotomy. Yeah, and it's a dichotomy, yes. Uh, yes, thank you. <laughs> or. Good, good. So I passed my quiz. Good. No more surprises, sorry. Right, so Elon and I have been working on diagonalizable flows for some time. So when I started, we were back in Princeton. And we yeah, wrote another theorem in that direction for diagonalizable flows. And at some point, he told me it's so, <coughs> it would be nice if there would be an argument somehow that's easier for the cases that we actually need. And the cases that we actually need were SL2R subgroups. So, yeah, so let me just quickly outline a case, a special case of the measure classification theorem that is much easier to prove. Um, outline 
of special case of measure classification for H being an SL2R inside a G and I don't care about G and I don't care about gamma. These could be general. Right. And what's the statement? I'm changing my world and instead of taking a one parameter unit put in subgroup, I'm asking what are the H invariant and ergodic probability measures on X G mod gamma and of course they're all homogeneous. That's the answer, that's her theorem. I stated it for one parameter unipotent subgroup, that was the conjecture, but of course it's much more general as long as the group is generated by unipotent subgroups, it's okay. Uh, always no, algebraic, maybe I wanted to write algebraic. No, homogeneous. Homogeneous was the word I was using, so let's use that word. And uh, the main trick is, well, the main trick is unipotent divergence of sorts. So let's get there. Um, you define L to be the stabilizer of mu. L contains H, obviously, and let's take the connected component. I don't care about things that stabilize the measure and far away. I want to find sort of a local description of what's going on. Um, yeah, the other thing that I need, and this sort of an easy, much easier effect than everything else that's going on here, um, I can take the one parameter subgroup, the horocyclic subgroup U, and this U will also act ergodically. By Mautner, by Mautner phenomenon, which is of course a trivial consequence and a stepping stone of the how move theorem. So, at some point I will need very crucially that H is SL2 or something semi-simple. But I also would like to have an ergodic theorem, and this H is way too big, we saw, this, we saw it already in your talk. SL2 is not amenable, so I can't define Fermat sequences and define an ergodic theorem, I would need to use something else. Um, but with this modern phenomenon, I can talk about an ergodic theorem for you, because you also act ergodically. So I can look at the one parameter ergodic theorem. I can define generic points. X in X is generic if 1 over t integral from 0 to t f of x, x uh, u of t dt converges to what it should converge to, right? I have an ergodic measure I can look at for every, as t goes to infinity, for every f in c, c, x, not assuming x is compact. So, yeah. yeah. You do it for one function, you do it for countably many functions, they are dense, and then you get this statement. So almost every point is generic. These are all sort of standard facts that we know from ergodic theory, dynamical systems, right? Now, there's one crucial moment where I will use that H is indeed same as simple. Namely, right now, I look at the Lie algebra, let's call it, yeah, fancy L, Lie algebra of L, that's H invariant is at H invariant inside the Lie algebra of G and H being semi-simple, there always exists an invariant complement to that subspace. So 
the subspace doesn't have much structure, it's just a subspace, but it's invariant under 8H. There exists a V 8H invariant such that G equals L plus direct sum V. And this is what allows myself to, allows me to sort of understand what's going on in the space very easily and very nicely. And this is this unipotent divergence property that, that Marina has been using and expanding and, and uh, yeah, in her proof of the measure classification. And yeah, so what's the idea here? I have a big space. I, I don't know how to draw sort of whatever dimensional D, are, D groups, right, and quotients. So this is my space X. And I have a point that's, that's equidistributing with respect to the measure mu. And now there are two, two scenarios that are somehow important. Let me use maybe red for the invariant complement. I have this point here, and then I can take the exponential of a small ball in V, push it down to a small transverse direction in the Lie group, then push it down to the, to the neighborhood of the point. So I get here sort of a small transversal direction. And there are two possibilities. Either, um, yeah, so this was my U orbit in the picture. Maybe I do another color for the for my L. So I have here somehow my L orbit, my local piece of the L orbit. And then inside of the L is of course the U, because the U is inside the H and the H is inside the L, whatever. Yeah, so I have this picture here, and there are two possibilities. It could be that all points in the neighborhood that are in important for the measure are actually in the green piece, in the green rectangle here. If that happens, if all points, which ones? All mu generic points near x belong to local L orbit, then the theorem is true. Then somehow this point, this generic point, typically the point belongs to the support of the measure. If it's not in the support, then it's not important, right? So um, there will be lots of points around that our original point X that will be typical for the measure, that will be generic for the measure. If all of them are in the green leaf here, then this green rectangle has positive measure. Ergodicity kicks in and I'm actually supported on a single orbit of this green subgroup. Yes? So when you say the theorem is true, you did not say, you want maybe want to point out that you're yeah. on the L orbit. Um, go mu of XL is equal to one. If I have that, then I get homogeneity. That's sort of easier to do. Thank you. So if I get that a small neighborhood has positive measure inside the green orbit, then by ergodicity, it has full measure. And I get the theorem. Right, so I'm assuming the opposite. I get some points outside, I have here different points, the different point that differs from the guy that I want in the, yeah, and, but I have that the measure, hmm, how do I draw this? So maybe this is my green thing of my point X, and then I have, here I have my transverse direction, and then I have here other points. But if this happens, because I have invariance in the green direction, I can do a, a very easy Fubini kind of argument 
move both of them a little bit and arrange it if I need to I change from, from this point to two other points and I arrange it so that I have two points that differ precisely by the, the direction of the invariant complement. It's sort of a Fabini argument using the fact that my measure is invariant in the green direction. And now I do that, I change here to the two points that differ by the invariant complement direction and both of them are generic. So I draw the orbit for both of them and both of these orbits sort of equidistribute in the space. I choose them small, close, close, very close together, these two points. If I choose them very close together, they will stay together for a long time because of continuity, but eventually they will start to, to drift apart. Um, so the way they drift apart here, the I need to expand my space. It's sort of just a draft anyway. So my space is a bit bigger, goes here then maybe goes down again and one of the orbit is sort of doing whatever it does and the second orbit maybe I switch the color the second orbit here at some point it will move away from the first one but because it's a unipotent trajectory it will not do this suddenly it will do this sort of leisurely like a polynomial does. And if I look at this long orbit that's starting to equidistribute and look at the last 10%, now let's even like look at the last percent of these two trajectories. This difference will be in the red direction and will be almost constant. And if I really look at the last 10%, this is actually much longer and is a mess in the space because it equidistributes. And this is much longer in this, is a mess in the space if it will equidistribute. But the difference is in the red part and is not changing along this, significantly, along this stretch of time. And that can be translated to saying that this actually belongs to the stabilizer. But that's then super weird because you can make that smaller if you want to by not waiting as long and choosing them arbitrarily close together here. And then you get a contradiction to your definition. Or they've said differently, you made your stabilizer actually bigger by dimension and you start from scratch and add again a dimension and again a dimension until you run into the problem that transversely you don't find any points. But then you run into this situation and you're homogeneous and you win. So it, this outline uses, of course, lots of ideas of, of Marina, but it circumvents also lots of the difficult and, and technical parts because of the simplifying assumption here that I had a semi-simple group. And with a semi-simple group, I have this invariant complement, and the invariant complement allows me to derive a contradiction. If I don't have the invariance of the complement, if I just have a linear complement, then I'll do this and most likely this will be again in the u direction or something in the L that I already understand. And that's then much harder and one needs to work harder to get extra information from, from this kind of argument. And yeah, this is not the topic of my talk. Are there any questions? Yeah. You don't care in which direction it's pointing. In which direction this one is pointing, I really don't care. It's just trans transversal to what I had because it's in L and L was invariant. Right, there's a simple calculation that if I take these two points and move forward, I don't know where it goes. But if I look at the displacement of the points, I see conjugation. And then I take the logarithm of conjugation, I see the adjoint, and that's why this is the right thing to study from the beginning. So in particular, yeah, it can be explained in a graduate class in, in an hour. And if you throw in some of the prerequisites, it takes a bit longer, but it, it's doable in a limited amount of time. Right. Right, so I was in Princeton and 
I told Elon of this argument, he liked it, and of course he told Akshay, and Akshay liked it, and of course Akshay is a number theorist, so he immediately wanted to make it effective. So let me tell you of the theorem that we proved with this idea. So that was joint work with Magulis and Akshay Venkatesh. Let X be a quotient where I Like my Lie group now should be the real points of an algebraic group. And I actually have an algebraic group of Q for a semi simple algebraic group over Q and gamma a congruence subgroup. commensurable with the integral structure that comes from the Q structure. So that's my space. Let H be a semi-simple subgroup without compact factors. I'll not give you the general theorem here. We had a technical assumption. I give you a stronger technical assumption now. Uh, the minimal technical assumption that we needed back then was that the centralizer of H should be discrete. So H should be kind of big inside G. But let me just make it even stronger for today to simplify the discussion of this theorem. Um, such that H is maximal, is a maximal subgroup, maximal connected, say, connected subgroup of G of R. There would be examples. Um, yeah, I'll give you an example in a minute. Now, I want an effective version of the mose Schaaf theorem. So, I'm looking at closed orbits of H. Let XH be a closed orbit. Okay, and effective means I want to say what, what they said without looking at a sequence and making a statement even for an individual ghost orbit. So they said if you have a sequence of such things, under this maximality condition, these orbits, they have to equidistribute in the big space because nothing else would make sense if you really change your sequence. If you keep having the same orbit all along, then yeah, that's a stupid choice. Um, so I would like to compare the Haar measure on the H orbit to the Haar measure of the big space. Then I integrate my test function. That's the normalized Haar measure on the orbit. I compare that to the integral over the normalized Haar measure of the whole space. And it's sort of half towards number theory. There's an implicit constant. Fine, that depends maybe on x. Of course, not on the function. That would be meaningless. Um, and then th there's some dependence on the function. Namely, 
I need to measure the smoothness property. So this is a Sobolev, Sobolev norm of F that's sort of cooked up for this homogeneous space. So some smoothness will be measured by this, but it's also measuring somehow if the function has support deep in the cusp that's also punished by this norm. So the function should be smooth and compact support on the space. And if the support is high up in the cusp, it, it's punished by a height function in the definition of the Sobolev norm. And here I want to look at the volume and look at the negative, have a negative exponent of the volume in the error term. So for a kappa greater than zero, the bending on G and H. I shouldn't have this, actually just the G, not the, not the fancy G, whatever, small difference. So I have a uniform kappa. The number of derivatives is specified? The number of derivatives can be figured out once one studies the proof sufficiently long. So it, yeah, the number of derivatives is not, can be figured out. It's concrete. Um, yeah, in the especially in the maximal case, it shouldn't be, depends a bit on the dimension and yeah. So the Sobolev embedding theorem, for instance, is used a few times. And that means that I need at least as many derivatives as dimension over two, but then a bit more because I want to have also some in, in this kind of argument, I want some s smoothness, some continuity properties, so, yeah. It's a concrete number that one can get from the proof. The exponent is maybe a bit trickier to get, but, yeah. In the concrete case, one can also get the exponent concretely. Right, so that's a theorem from back then, and it was really sort of a combination of of this idea, the way we proved it, there are other methods. I mean, Magulis had a different method in mind, but the way we wrote it then was using this idea. And what's important is that you sort of get, get generic points. You get this picture with generic points, except you need to have, you can't go to the limit because there are these, there's this, yeah. Okay, let's try it. Um, suppose the volume is super large. If the volume is super large, then you will have to see it in the space somehow that there is some bunching up of these local leaves. Because if, if there's a local leaf and then there's lots of space transversely and it never sort of aligns locally of one orbit on top of another orbit close by, if this never happens, volume can't be large because the space is compact, say. So you need to have this kind of picture where you have a local L orbit and then transversely another local L orbit sort of getting very close to the first one, but in a transverse direction. And then there's a definition of generic points which is effective because the mixing you can actually get effective. You need to say why this is true. And then this argument can sort of be started and, and applied and run and you will get that there's a direction that's very small and doesn't change the measure much. You're not getting actual invariance. You get that the measure doesn't change much if you push it in this transverse direction a little bit. But because of maximality, you can now take this small element, iterate it. You get bigger elements. You get sort of almost a one parameter subgroup. You can't iterate it too much because if you iterate it too much, your error will explode, but you get sort of a, a piece, one-dimensional direction transversely to your group that actually preserves the measure. And this direction, transverse direction, will almost preserve the measure. One has to define this and work with this. And then one takes commutators of this new direction with old elements of H, gets additional elements that almost preserve the measure. And one needs to show that the Lie group G can actually be generated by not too many commutators 
of these one parameter subgroups that you almost got. And once you are almost invariant under the whole group, you apply a spectral gap and you get a statement like this. Okay, so I said spectral gap. That spectral gap is sort of used twice in the theorem. Once in the last part that I just said, if you have almost invariance under all directions, you convolve and it's, it's actually easy to get to the conclusion. But before, there's a crucial point where you also need spectral gap for, but you need it in a much more uniform manner that you immediately think you might need. Okay, so the argument uses spectral gap twice. Once for G. And G might even be a property T group. And then it's really a very concrete uh, spectral gap. And one can, yeah, get it very nicely. But yeah. so Kastan's property T might enter the discussion, of course. Um, but w in, the, in the first application of the spectral gap in the proof, one needs spectral gap for the age action on L2 M X H X H. So you look at the orbit of your point you look at the Haar measure that's sitting on this orbit, you normalize the probability measure, you get an L2 space, and then you get uh, the Koopman unit of representation on the L2 space, and you need this guy to have spectral gap. Why is this sort of, why I make a, a fuss out of this? I'm making a fuss because the age is fixed. Sure, that, that was part of the theorem, the age is fixed, but the orbit is not fixed. So, this spectral gap needs to be uniform over all XH orbits considered. Again, if H itself is property T, this is great. One has the spectral gap, doesn't have to think harder why you get it, but if H is SL2 or some other rank 1 group that doesn't have property T, then this uniformity is a version of, uh, is sort of, yeah. yeah, for SL2, if the H is SL2 and if closed SL2 orbits, then it would be Selberg's theorem or Jacquet Langlands would be some other direction, but in general, you, we need close else property T. Tau, thank you. <laughs> so this is precisely saying this. If you have congruence quotients of your group, H, these congruence quotients of uniform spectral gap. And we need it precisely in this form because even though the H is staying the same, the orbit here, the, the H orbit, is itself isomorphic to H more the stabilizer, but the Q structure of that stabilizer could vary. And because of that, this uniformity needs to be the strongest uniformity that's known. But it's known in particular, so it can be used. Um, this, this application is sort of nice because it actually gives uh, it gives an effective, implies an effective ergodic theorem for the U action. Right? What does spectral gap mean? Spectral gap 
means that you have an effective mixing statement. That's what you should think of. That spectral gap is an effective mixing statement. Now mixing, of course, implies ergodicity. So effective mixing should imply effective ergodicity. What does effective ergodicity mean? It means that you should have an effective ergodic theorem, e effective pointless ergodic theorem. So you're interested in points that have the property that when you integrate your test function f x u t uh, from zero to capital T, one over capital T minus in dt minus integral f dm x h, because we're looking on this h orbit, we want to have an estimate that says this is bounded by capital T to some exponent, kappa 1, Sobolev norm of f. We want an es estimate like this, and if we have an estimate like this, for all sufficiently large t, then we say this x is generic for when it, we have this parameter that says this holds starting from some t no zero. And then we saw, yeah, for all t bigger than t zero, that would be the definition of t zero generic. And there are two things that we make effective, that need to be made effective in the point versus ergodic theorem, because the point versus ergodic theorem is saying, yes, something converges, but it also says something is an null set. And both of these things need to be said effectively. So this is the error rate. And then the, the statement, uh, no. So that's important, there's some extra work to make it independent of, of the function. And that's another step where the Sobolev norm is sort of increasing to handle not just one function, but sort of simultaneously for all functions. So there's some trickery to make it happen. But one, what one gets is that the measure of the set of all points, so that x is not t naught generic, that's again, say, bounded by 1 over t0. There's some game between this exponent and the exponent here and the spectral gap exponent. But is the, there are two x's. Are they supposed to be the same? Do you simultaneously? It's, yeah, because whether I write here x0 or x is completely irrelevant because my point that is interesting to oh, me yes. is actually on the orbit. Yeah, but you're right. I should have written x0. Yes, thank you. Anyway, this is a quick outline of... And the spectral gap for G is used for which step? Uh, once I have sort of transverse invariance, yeah. I want to say that this transverse invariance plus my maximum subgroup, if I iterate, they accommodate as I get all directions, I want to say that this almost invariance actually transports to the statement that I wanted. And for this, I need the spectral gap at G. I just convolve the function. The H measure on the whole space doesn't notice that. This integral doesn't change. And the H measure of the subgroup doesn't notice that either. Be not much because of the invariance that I got. But the uh, L2 norm decreases, uh, orthogonal to the constants, the L2 norm decreases. Smoothness improves, actually, by convolution. And all of these things together say that after convolving a few times, my function is constant, more or less, and the integral didn't change. So for both measures, didn't change or didn't change much, and then together I get that the integrals didn't differ much. Yeah, thanks. Right, what I actually wanted to talk about was a delic equidistribution, so let's get there. So this is another theorem, a bit close in, in dates. Um, <coughs> joined with Magulis, Amir Mohammadi, second time he features today, um, and Akshay. Yeah, there's this unspoken rule that you shouldn't talk about Adels in, in a talk, right? So I'm breaking two rules at once. I'm speaking about it, and I'm speaking about it. Um, so just a quick reminder, what is the Adels? 
it's R cross something like a product of the QPs of all P's. So you need to swallow the PLX and then you take the product of all PLX. That's the wrong thing to take the product of all PLX because if you do, you get a crazy space. So you have to restrict the product somehow, but it's all very natural and gives you a super nice ring, locally compact, metric, whatever you want. It's a super nice ring that contains Q as a lattice. So if you, the standard example of lattices is Z in R, but if you're bored with Z, you want to look at Q and then you need to invent this space. It's kind of natural. Right, so let G be semi-simple, uh, defined over Q. Now let's even say simple, Q simple. <coughs> Why not? Then there exists a kappa greater than zero. So this is now a bit different in the previous theorem I also had a kappa, but I said that the kappa depends on G on the H. H didn't feature yet, so kappa depends only on G such that, and yeah, what is happening? Now I need an H. Um, let H, right, I want to put here some extra parameters, simply con Vected. Again, not super necessary for the theorem, but that statement becomes a bit more ne messy if I don't assume that. So I want it to be simply connected, Q simple. Let H be simply connected, Q simple, or Q semi simple. Iota a map from an algebraic homomorphism from H into G, so I can embed this H somehow into G, so that iota of H is maximal as an algebraic group in G. Let G be in G equals G of A, and define why I'm looking at the Adelic quotient of H H of A mod H of Q is that Q is a lattice in A so H of Q is a lattice in H of A right of course that's a theorem and then I push this under this algebraic, um, yeah, defined over Q, this map is just a polynomial map over Q with rational coefficients. So if I have here something well-defined up to rationals on the left and I apply this algebraic homomorphism, I get something well-defined up to rationals on the left. And then I push it by this extra element G because this is natural, it sort of often happens like this. That's my set Y, which depends of course on the H, on the embedding map and on the group element. Okay, then we are again trying to prove a Moses Schaaf theorem. So is the maximal in what sense? Um, as algebraic groups or connected as a Q group. As a Q. Yes. <coughs> Technical Yes. Is same Everything is same as simple. Yeah, all the groups are same as simple. I rely on, on spectral gap all the time. I rely on this transverse argument. So I need semi-simple groups. Then I'm comparing again my test integral over my test function y dm y minus integral f x. Did I say what x is? X is the obvious thing. Why, why did you uh, mention any embedding of h in g? Previously h was a subgroup of g to begin with. Okay, let, let me finish the statement and then I get back to your question. So again, I want an inverse power of the volume. That's my exponent here and I want some Sobolev norm. 
And this time the Sobolev norm measures smoothness at infinity. It's punished if the support is too high up in the cusp. But it's also punished if the level of the function is high. Um, so one needs to do an adelic decomposition and a function is smooth for the p-adics if it's locally constant. And if it's sort of very weakly locally constant, you should punish the function and blow up the Sobolev norm accordingly. And there's a, there's a definition that goes over a couple of pages and in the end it's a function, a Sobolev norm that has the correct properties and does everything you wanted. Right, that's a good question. So there are two questions here. One is what is this? And the other one is why the heck do I make a fuss about this age? And before I was less of a problem. So let me answer your question first, even for your volume is part of the statement. Um, before I worked only in the real world, a typical example, a good example for the previous theorem would have been SO3-1, SO21, sorry, SO21 inside SL3R. That's a good example to keep in mind for the previous theorem. That's maximal and I can, but it's important that it's fixed somehow. And the way I want to apply this theorem here is I want to, for instance, say, okay, I want to apply it for SOQ, H being an SOQ. But this time I don't say anything about the signature. So this SOQ could be compact at the real place. And if I change Q, it could be compact at the two-adic place, at the three-adic place, at the five-adic place. If I keep changing the quadratic form, I keep having a group that's compact at more and more primes. If I fix a group, then I would never be able to apply the theorem to a fixed compact group. So I, I actually want to, to have the freedom of changing the group in the theorem. Because it will allow me to get statements that were previously unattainable by the methods. So this is called the splitting condition somehow. Uh, in the Linux type of problems, Linux type equidistribution problems, one frequently encounters a Linux splitting condition. You know that as well as I. Some of our theorems have this condition. And I'm trying to avoid it here. I'm trying to say that HP is simply connected Q semi-simple. That's what I'm saying. But I didn't say n fix a prime so that H of QP is non-compact without compact factors or something. I didn't say that. And that omission is sort of very critical. It's, it's making the proof much harder, but it's making the theorem much more powerful because I can use it for cases that where the prime that, that is non-compact depends on H and is sort of moving out. Um, volume. Right. Um, so I need to give you a definition of the volume, especially because the group is moving, right? The group, the H is moving, so I can't fix the Haar measure on H and say, oh, I normalize the Haar measure and you define the volume using that normalization of the Haar measure, except that I sort of do, but I need to give it a definition. So what's the volume of Y? That's, I take the measure of some neighborhood, omega is some neighborhood in G of A, compact neighborhood of the identity, and they take the inverse of, of that. No, MH, I need to tell you what MH is. So, what is H? H is the thing that's acting here and leaves the orbit invariant. So H is equal to G inverse iota H of A G. That's my H. That's a nice subgroup of G, which are defined. And, and what's MH? MH is normalized is the normalized Haar measure
on H so that MH of a fundamental domain is equal to 1. So MH is the it's normalized H measure of H that's compatible with the H measure on Y. Y is the H orbit and there's a fundamental domain inside H that's mapped onto precisely onto in an objective manner Y and I take my H measure on H so that this is 1 and then I say okay this is like the unit ball and I just say the unit actually the unit ball should have measure 1 so I define my volume using this inverse so I, another way of saying this is I compare the volume of the fundamental domain to the volume of this fixed set and use the ratio to define the volume of the set of the, of the orbit right so I'm running out of time but let me say that there's one key other ingredient. We still need the spectral gap. We still need this, this dynamical argument that I had explained. It's also in there. But somehow it, we use this dynamical argument. But where are the unipotents? And that's unclear as, as I said it so far. Because I did say that this H this H of R could be compact. Then there are no unipotents at H of R. But of course the same thing could happen with many primes. So let's say P is good if H is, I really have to say this word, quasi-split. It's, it's a nice word. Quasi-split over QP. And the, the other one is sort of less technical, but easier to understand. <laughs> um, G inverse H QP G is not distorted. Somehow it could be that H is super split and everything, but the G is sort of doing crazy stuff to the, to the subgroup. And this distortion makes it then hard to actually use the the geometry of the group or the relationship of the simple group with the big simple group because of this big distortion. So I say B is good if say H is split over that prime and the conjugated group is not distorted, not too distorted. A little bit I would survive but yeah. Now what we need is... Where is G there? What? This was G. <laughs> Um, the G is fixed. The G is my point that defines the okay, orbit. Okay. Yeah. Thanks. Um, yes. So what we need is the adelic volume formula of Prasad and also the paper in a, for a more technical reason, the paper of Borel Prasad around 1989 or something. So around the time of, of Ratner, Brassard had a formula that really established an, an expression that measures the adelic volume, which is really related in spirit to what we defined here. He used it for a different purpose. But this formula we use to say there exists a good prime P with P is bounded by a power of the logarithm of the volume squared. Somehow the dynamics, if you use the unipotent arguments at P, if P is very large, you can't use them very effectively because QP has these large gaps in a way, right? There are, there are elements of QP norm less or equal than one. And the next ones, 
in QP have norm P, but if P is very large, that's sort of a big gap in some way. And because of that, whenever you try to use p-adic dynamics and pay attention to how the dynamical statements depend on the prime, you will be punished by powers of the prime. And they sort of accumulate as you keep arguing and keep arguing and you have some powers of the prime in the end. But if you have an estimate like this and you know that there's a p to the 100 in the estimate appearing at the end, you don't care because what you're aiming for and what you're establishing sort of in the, in the process is you adhere a power of p to the 100 but you have proven something like this and p is bounded by log of the volume so you don't care about this you can erase it change this a bit and you win so it's important that you have some kind of estimate and this estimate would be good enough and that's that's sort of a, a deep input of a deep, deep additional input of the theorem that we can choose this good prime and it's again what I said earlier if you if you're sort of interested in a special case it would be much easier so for instance if your age is an orthogonal group this orthogonal group is defined by quadratic form the quadratic form has a discriminant somehow the, the, the volume that I defined here and the discriminant they are very much related and then you can say okay like can I get something like this using the discriminant and the answer is it's very easy if your prime is not good for you actually the prime has to divide the discriminant and now you ask how many primes how many of the first n primes if all the first n primes divide the discriminant then the discriminant is like n factorial big it's crazy big and the n plus first prime is super small in comparison to the to the discriminant so if you do it for a quadratic form it's a it's very easy thing if you do it in general for let h be simply connected q simple semi simple and so on you need a general machinery and and Prasad provides us with this general machinery and there's a bit of work to make it work for us but in the end we get this statement and the estimate for the good prime and can apply the same kind of shearing arguments at the prime that is potentially far out need to use that extra direction we got sort of effectively to generate more of the group just like in the real case but always paying attention to the prime and yeah thank you Yeah, I guess so, yeah. There are, there's another case which, yeah, I could now talk another half an hour. There's another case where you sort of get something like this very easily and that is interesting because we can use this machine in some sense to, to reprove a big chunk of the Grossell's property tau. It doesn't give the correct, yeah, what's correct? It doesn't give the the known good exponent for the spectral gap but it gives you a uniform spectral gap and there this this bound is very easily achieved because you just choose p constant depending on capital G and and then this is completely trivial and yeah thanks Yeah. So is it possible to translate proof just uh, mm, I don't see that. So sub you're assuming that H is maximal. is maximal, is um, but is possibly conjugated in some yes. sense, right? And the Q structure behind could also change. <coughs> and in a way, if the if the H is being conjugated in a weird way and is being distorted <coughs> in the real place 
then I don't know how to use our argument at the real place. But actual conjugate, that doesn't change. Um, that that's, um, doesn't change the, ah, you're just pushing it. You're just pushing an existing thing. If your age is maximal, maybe you can use mixing, but not really our argument. Um, so in the SOQ case, for instance, you can use the mixing argument precisely for such um, purposes. But in general, our argument sort of, in this case, you push the real place, it becomes distorted. I don't want to use the real place. I have to use a periodic place. If you, if you push an existing orbit, then the same thing happens that I said here, that you can use the prime p equals 5. If your group is split at p equals 5, just use the prime p equals 5. It will work for all the pushed orbits. And then the proof drastically simplifies because I just have to do the previous outline at the periodic, at the five attic place, five being fixed, and then I don't need to use um, Brassard, Borel, Brassard for anything. Yeah, thanks. The thing simplified in assume H is of maximal rank. Would it simplify if H is of maximal rank? Or I don't see how, I'm, yeah, maybe. I mean, what we really would like to do is get rid of this maximality and centralized assumption. There would be lots of nice applications in number theory. If we get rid of that, and yeah, at some point we will we'll attempt that. We are maybe not super far away, but first we need to get this paper accepted. Maybe the referee is here. Never mind. <laughs> Thanks. Okay.